It's 11 o'clock. I'm going to go right to my first guest with the question that you raise. How do you teach and train and educate a child to imitate the brothers that are putting in the work for the long haul, like your Dr. Christopher Emden's, like your Mr. Witherspoon's, like my Dr. Hall from back in the day? How do you teach and train up a child to imitate the brothers who are going to put in the work for the long term on the right side of of the law. My first guest was here last year on May 17th, 2014. So that's nearly three years ago. That was a show we did called The Voice Inside Your Head, a show we did based upon a book of the same name, The Voice Inside Your Head by author Lloyd Burnett. That was show 192. Today is show 231. That was nearly three years ago. And back then the brother told me he was a life changing versifier. Let's see if he remembers that. Brother Quasey Washington, welcome to you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to hear your voices. Do you remember welcome saying that? Back. Welcome back. Life changing versifier. And it's still true. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It's true to this day, okay? It, it remained true, huh? It, it's, it's still the same, brother. It's still the same. Well, it's good to hear your voice, as Dante said, and good to have you back. When we left off last time, I remember you were working with young people in some capacity. So I want to put this question mm-hmm. right to you and then we'll re- rewind and catch up. But as we talk about the spiritual power of a black male teacher, what comes to your uh-huh. to the top of your mind as someone who works either directly or peripherally in the field of education? First and foremost, it's a wake up call to our entire community. Black male black woman. I know the woman is very prevalent and visible in our school systems. However, for our African-American men, it's very important that no matter what field, it's dire. At this point, no matter what your background is, you have to spend time in the educational system, in youth development, and in the community. We have to give back at this point because our ideal of just me and mine is not working. So we have to actually contribute in the school systems, in the youth after-school programs, because there's thousands of children who need our help. We have the skill set. We have the resources. We have the staff in our hands, and we're continuously waiting for some savior to come into our community and save our children. No, we have everything. We are equipped, and we just have to make the conscious decision, open up our hearts, and say, you know what? I am committed to saving our children. Someone did it for us, right? We have to do it for this next generation and generations to come, and we can't be afraid of it. We're looking for this piece of the pie and this money, and as you were talking about earlier, this fast money and trying to be successful and basing it on how much money we have, but we're not going to be successful until our community is successful. And I really think that we have to really dive into this, no matter how much money you make, and save our children. Well, let me play something for you and get your thoughts on the other side of this. Let's go. When I can't fully express my brilliance on my own term in the academic space and I get pushed out of that space, I go to reclaim another space to be able to express my intelligence and my brilliance. Now, the inability for schools to recognize the forms of brilliance expect, expressed in a non-academic spaces is not a reflection of the inability of the population, it's a reflection of the inability of the school to understand the complexity of my knowledge. Look, the goal here, and I keep telling y'all this, is, is for us to understand that we got to get young folks to feel like they are equally as ratchet as they are academic. (laughs) Some folks in here don't even know what I mean by ratchet. (laughs) The understanding that, just a little hood dictionary, to be be ratchet is to be, you know, in, in an urban space and fully exemplify all that folks think are the most negative aspects of urban culture, right? So I've been called ratchet a bunch of times, right? Because he loud and he talk a lot. Ain't he from Columbia? Why he saying ain't? You know, like those kind of questions. But, but I, I pride myself on being equally as academic. I'm an anthrobiochemist by training. You ask me something about chemistry, I'll flip it on you in a heartbeat. But, but, but here, I, I could do it if I need to, bro. Right? You know what I mean? I could tell you, I'm a physicist, lyricist, spitting this ridiculousness to witness the ignorance I dismiss if Newton lost emotion, but y'all ain't even ready. But, but here's the point. Here's the point. Here's the point. The point is, 
One might express a very vernacular form of discourse that is perceived as non-academic and they're treated as though they don't have the opportunity to be able to engage academically. And the more that schools can open up and allow those vernacular forms of cultural expression to be valued in academic spaces, young folks express their brilliance in schools and then attach themselves to traditional academic knowledge. Your inability to recognize that is what leads us to what we're doing today. Y'all understand me? So the goal of school is to construct and celebrate academic identities. That was brother, brother, doctor, doctor, brother, Christopher Emden, who is an associate professor at Teachers College, Columbia University. That's another part of his speech that he gave a few days ago at South by Southwest EDU conference in Austin, Texas. I want to break down what the brother said and get your thoughts, brother Quasi. When I can't fully express my brilliance on my own terms in the academic space and I get pushed out of that space, I go, he's talking about young black brothers and sisters. I go to reclaim another space to be able to express my intelligence and my brilliance. Now, the inability for schools to recognize the forms of brilliance expressed in non-academic spaces is not a reflection of the inability of the population of these black and brown students. It is a reflection of the inability of the school to understand the complexity of my knowledge. How do you respond to that as someone who works in education yourself and youth development? Let me tell you something. It is so true. I, I agree with him wholeheartedly because what is happening and has happened for many, many years in education is white people specifically feel that they come to the urban areas in the city to save black children. Mm -hmm. You don't come to our schools and our communities to save us. And those educators that's in those communities, African American, that's in those communities, they feel like we don't know how to deal with our people. So there's this struggle and this battle time. Well, I work in Chicago, West Side, right? Mm -hmm. New school, very impoverished community on the West Side. And last year when we opened the school, and I was grateful to be a part of it, everyone wanted to teach me how to deal with our children. This year, I'm teaching them how to deal with our children because they finally recognize, oh, I think you have a little more expertise. I mean, when I tell you, when you're talking about droves of teachers that thought they could come and save these black kids, and they're running out the door because they can't handle these black kids because they, again, don't don't understand their brilliance. I have to develop curriculum and training in the beginning of the year. We go through all of our staff. This year, I created a training that talks about understanding your own bias. First of all, white people, before you can ever work with African-American children, you got to understand that you have some bias. And we ain't faulting you for your bias, whether it comes <laughs> from it being handed down from your DNA or whether it is whatever. Yeah, it just it's comes from them being white in America. Bias. That's where it comes from, no deeper than that. Right. Just being right. white in America, right. you're going to have some bias. Exactly. Exactly. Go ahead, brother. Exactly. So you just can't come in here and try to school us, right? So I had to make sure that they understood their bias because what my school is primarily 99.9% .9 African-American and brown children. And so before you could even touch them or educate them, you got to understand them. You have to understand where they're coming from. You got to understand their struggles. And it's so much more than what you teach in that classroom. You have to understand trauma. I mean, in kindergarten, who have experienced trauma already, so their behavior is different when they come to class. Okay, let's uh, pause right there. Line. Let's pause right there because you let's go. You put it right into the heart of the hood. And on your point about yeah. they don't understand these black folks or these black children. Brother Dr. Christopher Emden in an article called What White Folks Who Teach in the Hood Get Wrong About Education basically echoed everything you just said. But I want to read his specific words. This article is called What White Folks Who Teach in the Hood Get Wrong About Education, written by Kenya Downs for the PBS News Hour. Look that up. Google that. March 28th, 2016. And she quotes Dr. Chris Emden in this article. And here's her question to him. Tell us about your teacher workshops. How are white teachers learning to move beyond the savior complex? And that's what Brother Quasey just spoke on. And here's Dr. Chris's answer. Dr. Chris is the same Dr. Chris in the clip that I just played. Here's his answer to that question. And this is exactly what you were speaking on, Brother Quasey. He says, Dr. Chris, I bring teachers into the communities of their students, a barbershop, 
a black church, and even hip-hop ciphers. It's having teachers understand that it's not them going to see the quote-unquote exotic other in their own element, but rather an opportunity for them as teachers to learn about the students. Teachers go in there with notebooks, a pen and pad in hand, and are really prepared to learn. They look at the preacher and his voice inflections, the way his hands move, and how that garners a response from the audience. It's a structured sermon, but he's allowing the audience to walk freely around and be creative. There's also something about what the black barber does that is pedagogical. A haircut is like a teacher's content. You can go anywhere and get information, but can you go anywhere and get a haircut? But they come back to that particular barber because of the experience. We bring teachers to the barber shop and hang out. And that is exactly the need that you're discussing that teachers, that white teachers specifically have, Brother Quasi. Indeed. Indeed. Especially, I, I love the part about the barbershop because every brother know if you need some information, <laughs> you need a laugh, you need to be educated on something, you go to the barbershop. Mm-hmm. I'm going today. And I'm telling you, 127 <laughs> and Bishop, Infinite Style, shout out to E Dollar here in Chicago. <laughs> I'm telling you, every time I go into the barbershop, anything I need to know as to just on the ground level of what's going on in our community, I find out there. Mm -hmm. So until I agree, until white people are willing to do that, go to the barbershop, spend time with the family, do home visits, go to their churches, go to their mosques, spend time with the family, until they're willing to do that, they'll never understand that. And it really has to be intentional in our communities. You're not going to come in and save our community. You need to be a part of the community. You may need to move into our community. You may need to actually spend time. Good luck with that. I think that's key, though, well, Brother Quasi. I mean, you may say that partly in jest, but I think it's just as important for the teachers to live in the community as I think it is for the police officers that police our neighborhoods to live in our neighborhood. I think they're yeah. both very, very important. But what I want to specifically focus on, because I get your point and I take your point and I receive your point about white teachers and it is it is an important point I want to focus on the young black boys that Dante spoke about that are watching and imitating some of these men and you're one of the men that some of these young boys young girls too but I'm hyper focusing on young black men that's where my attention is in this moment you're one of those men that these young boys see every day that is an incredible opportunity. So what I want to know from you is how you handle that and how you see them responding just to the very essence of who you are each day. Oh, my goodness. Let me tell you something. First of all, you'll see sometimes on my Facebook page, I always tell the parents, you know, I have authorization of release. I post videos of my children, mm-hmm. whether they're in trouble or whether they're doing well. My presence at my school and his other brothers there, right? None of us. First of all, let me just put that out. None of us are directly in the classroom. Mm -hmm. We're all in administration and or dealing with behavior. And then, of course, we have maintenance workers. Mm -hmm. But all the brothers, no matter where we go, the children in the school, the children try to emulate us. They try to imitate us. When I walk into a room, you'll see my children begin to tap each other. Mr. Washington is here. You better straighten up. I'm telling you. It happens every day. Mm. Sometimes I have to go to my office and laugh about it because of how powerful my presence is. And I, I hear me. That didn't come through education, and it didn't come through me even planning to be that powerful. It's because they do not witness it in their home, and sometimes they don't see brother dressed up and educated and speaking the king's language, as they say. It's just something that they give you. Mm-hmm. It's an honor. It's a privilege. But they also know you care about me. And most of my children, when they're interviewed about outside sources that come in and want to know why our school is becoming very successful, even in its second year, the children will say, when I grow up, because that's one of the questions they ask, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a director like Mr. Washington. That has nothing to do with me, bro. It's because of what they see. Mm -hmm. And they don't see that. When they're in the community, they see the brothers on the block. I'm a little different from the brother on the block, right? Mm Mm-hmm. When they go to church, they see their pastors, and that's wonderful. But a lot of times, even there, 
the black male is kind of absent. So when they come to school, they're looking for me. One of the young brothers I had, and I'll give you a quick example. Yesterday, anger management issues, they're trying to put him on medication. They're going to do all this kind of therapy. And see, the white teachers, they go, and every time he has a meltdown, they're coddling him. They're on the floor with him, pampering him. When Mr. Washington comes, I don't do any of that. I don't do all that. First of all, you can't even talk to me with your head down, period. All of my students know that. And right now, in our second year, we only have K through second grade. Mm -hmm. We have primary students. Mm -hmm. They can't even talk. So you get yourself together, you do your deep breathing, you go through <laughs> some uh, social emotional learning and intelligence, and when you come to yourself, you hold your head up and then you look me straight in my eye, right? First of all, you're not inferior. I want my children to know that. Right. Talking about adultism, right? You right. do have choices, right? Even at this young age, you have choices. But first of all, you get yourself together. When you get yourself together, let me know. And my children know that. So they take time, and you see them doing their deep breathing, and they sit in there, and then they finally say, Mr. Washington, I'm ready to talk. Then they come, and they talk to me with their head up, and they explain to me what's going on. Yesterday, this student specifically, they had recess, and the kids were playing football. The kids weren't allowing him to have football, and it sent him into a rage. They wasn't throwing him the ball, right? <laughs> right. He goes storming out of the classroom. He's angry. He's punching walls. Well, he comes to my office looking for me, but I'm not there because, of course, I'm in around the school because he's trying. He knows Mr. Washington wants me to pull this together. I got to get myself together. I'm a little out of control, and I need some help, so let me go find Mr. Washington. I wasn't in the office. Next thing I know, he's in the middle of the floor with the teacher on the ground. <laughs> I walk over, and I said, you already know. <laughs> I'm going to count to five. You don't get your butt up. You already know. I don't play that. One, two, and I go to five, right? He stands up. I'm angry. Uh-huh. Come to my office. Because, see, I, it's cameras out in this hallway, and I can't say to you what I want to say to you right, right now. Watch me, this audience. But you come on in my office. Uh-huh. You be angry in my office. And then we went through the process. He calmed himself down, and I said, what is wrong with you? And he finally told me what happened. And I just looked at him like, that's what you're upset? I said, how, how old do you think Mr. Washington is? He said, 25. I said, no, I'm 40, son. Now, what if every time I don't have my way, I just go and roll? And fall out, floor. right. <laughs> He looked at me, he said, he would probably call the police. And I said, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm doing. Exactly. Police on your way Exactly. And now you in my floor. All right. Because I got to tell him right now, I can't set you up for failure, right? It's so much deeper. It's not just the traditional education, the system, the testing with our black boys. It's so much more. We have to touch every area of their lives in order to be successful. When the bottom line is, after I finished talking to the brother, he was upset about them making faces and not passing his ball, but he's also angry that he's not sleeping at night. You know why he's not sleeping at night? Because his mama goes to parties all week long, car parties, whatever, and he has to go with her. And he just want to get some sleep. Now, this is a brother telling me this, and he's in the second grade, so he's really frustrated about that, and now that he's not having his way, he's ready to jump out on everybody because, really, I'm just tired. I'm tired, Mr. Washington. I'm exhausted, right? So I have to deal with the whole gamut. So, I have to deal with all of them. So second grade, so second grade, second grade is how old? How old is second grade? Second grade is seven and eight, eight year old. So he's a seven year old who's telling you that really, once you had the time to calm him down and sit him down, yeah. the real issue is not yeah. reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's that the brother is not the young brother is not sleeping at night because his mama is carting right. him out to card parties all over town. Oh, man, come on here. Yes. Wow. And the thing about it is I have to teach him how to uh, have some self-control and how to calm himself down. Because like yesterday, some days Mr. Washington is not going to be there. Quasi is not going to be there. What are you going to do when I'm not there? So I can't just set you up that only I'm the only person that can help. No, you have to be able to do this for yourself. And I have to do this now on a K to second grade level. I have to start right now calming these babies down, getting them to understand I'm out of control. I need to be in control. And I have the power to control myself. Education is more than just can I read history, math, and science. You are educated them as self-control, particularly as black men in the society that will end right now. You need to understand your environment, you need to know how to handle yourself in, in accordance to be able to be treated with respect and dignity, and when you find yourself in particular situation, you have to be educated, and if nobody's telling you how to calm yourself down, you're going to be in the wrong place doing this particular sit, and then you could end up being in 
the penal system were in jail for, yeah. for basically plain terms because nobody showed you or educated you on how to have self-control. Our white counterpart will say, oh my God, this behavior is uncontrolled. We're just going to suspend him for a few days. And I have to go and advocate and say, oh no, you're not going to suspend him. You know why you're not going to suspend him? Because when he go home, he's still exposed to all of these negative behaviors. So it's not good for him to go home. He needs to be here. So we need to do in-school suspension, or we need some extra time or detention or something. And that's what we'll give him. But he needs to be here with me and with all the other teachers that really give a damn. Well, let me ask you this, brother, because what you're speaking of is the way that these young boys see you. And how the other part of my question to you earlier was, how are you managing that responsibility? Because these are seven and eight-year-olds, so it, it may not be highly likely that you see them outside of school but as they get older they're gonna see mr washington at the car wash and at the bowling alley and at the other places how does it make you feel about how you live your life knowing that these young boys are looking at you in that way let me tell you something i didn't ask for any of this right my ideal of going to school i was going to be in journalism right Mm -hmm. i was going to be on the news i was going to be an anchor and that's all i wanted to do (laughs) and then i ended up in youth development which led me to education and um, i've been here ever since it is a huge burden. Yes, it is. It's a huge responsibility, and I don't take it lightly. I understand it. I have come to terms with it. I have also come to terms with this is my calling, right? Right. right. I didn't necessarily want to do it, but it is a calling. It is. Right? Everybody can do what I do. Everybody don't have the patience to do what I do. But the more and more, the older they get, yeah, these kids see me. In fact, on tomorrow, our family from the school. Mm-hmm. One of our partners, one of the churches in on the west side, I live on the south side, but on the west side, near the school, one of our partners, one of the pastors and I trust, we're taking the families to church. I'm talking about mama, if daddy want to come, grandmama, whoever. I don't care. We're going to church all together. The teachers, support staff, we're all going to church. This is the first time our school has ever done this, right? But it's so important. Every child, and it's not going to be possible, but every child I saw all week, make sure you tell your mother, remind your mom, I want you to be in church on Sunday, and I want you to sit by Mr. Lamont, right? Mm-hmm. That's what they call me on the side, mm-hmm. Mr. Lamont. But hear me, every child is not going to be able to sit by me. I understand that, and I'm aware of that. But for them, they, oh, I get to sit by Mr. Lamont in church. I don't go to church. I'm going to church. <laughs> right. I'm sitting next to him. Oh, yeah, I'm there. Mom, I need to go to church. So the moms are calling. The dads are calling like, okay, what time the service start? My child is excited. It's that continuum. It's not just in that school building. I have to make impact their entire lives. Mm -hmm. So I take them somewhere that I trust for them to get spiritual nourishment. Now, I understand they're not all going to stay and become Christian. Right? right? That's my way to God. That's how I get there. But the principles and the foundations of what we give them now, no matter what religion they go into, they'll remember it for the rest of their days, and they'll practice something. Mm-hmm. But they'll have to know there is a God. There is a God. And we have to individually find that journey to Him. But that's one of the reasons I am who I am. It's because of my prayer life and, and my foundation, and that I was introduced to a mighty God. I I couldn't be sane, brothers, I couldn't be sane with all the hell that I've experienced in my life if I couldn't find my peace spiritually. And so that's what I want to offer to even five-year-olds. Let's talk about some of that. We've only got a few minutes left, but let's talk about some of that hell that you've been through. We've talked about some of it before, but I'm most curious about in the last three years since you've been here, how your life has evolved Uh and how you've personally developed. Because even Dante mentioned to me in the notes, you know, we write notes to each other while, while we're on the air. And even he's saying to me here that he he can hear a command in your voice that he didn't necessarily hear before the last time you were here three years ago. And my response to him was, yes, the brother has evolved. So tell us about your evolution over the last three years. Well, let me tell you, first of all, when I was on the show before I moved, I was just really getting used to Chicago, right? I Mm -hmm. knew I was trying to find my way in Chicago. I knew God brought me here. I just didn't know what the Lord wanted me to do. And I tried to do everything my way. Right. I was doing some consulting work. Things were failing. I was with another program. It wasn't the right program. And things seemed to have just been falling apart. But it was in those struggles 
mm-hmm. that I really had to have that come to Jesus moment. Mm-hmm. And I had to look at myself in the mirror and say, hey, what are you doing? Get yourself together. Right. What are you called to? And if I trace the hand that has been over my life, mm-hmm. one thing I know is I have been rooted and grounded from birth. Mm-hmm. You hear me? Mm-hmm. In civil rights, race and social justice. And um, education, just different things continue to reoccur. So I had to really go back over my life and say, what are those themes that's becoming very consistent? What's those themes that continue to occur in your life? And face it. And that's when I finally came to, again, like I told you, I didn't want it, but I had to face, brother, this is your calling. And you're trying to do everything else and make all this money. You're trying to be rich and you're trying to do all that when you've never begged for bread. Let's be clear, even in the lowest points of your life. God has always provided for you. He has always had provision for you. But this is your calling, and you need to just answer it. Right. Amen. The universe is saying, answer the call. And things wasn't going right for me because I didn't answer the call. I didn't want the call. Mm -hmm. And now I have. And I think that's what you hear. I finally settled. This is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to help young people. In answering your calling, did it feel like the death of something else? Let me tell you something. I know this is not the end. I don't know what God has for me next. But this is definitely a stepping stone. And I have peace like I have never known. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's not that I don't have struggles or, or troubles. We all have them. But I can cope and I can deal with them a lot better mm-hmm. because I'm actually operating where I'm supposed to operate. Mm-hmm. I'm in place. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the difference. Once a brother finally get in place and accept his calling, all oh, life is easy. I don't care what hell you go through. You're preaching you now, can, brother. You, you can get through it. So now yeah. I know what I didn't know 30 minutes ago when you first came on. What I know what I'm hearing now. I didn't know what I was hearing before. Now I know what I'm hearing because mm-hmm. you, you just preached it to me. It is the power that is coming from you from being in your place and operating from that place. Right. That's what it is. Indeed. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. It's not glory to me. It's only gl- glory to God. And I really think sometimes I-, I laugh to myself. I think the creator just sits there like, dude, you could have did this 20 years ago. If you just did it and humbled yourself, you could have did this 20 years ago. But it-, it was my process, right? I had to go through the hills and the valleys until I finally got to the mountaintop. I just See, I actually you don't, th- I actually I- don't <laughs> think that the creator says you could have did this 23 years ago. No, because you had to, you wouldn't have been ready 20 years ago. It's because you went through every hamlet, forged every river, went over every stream, climbed every mountain, you know, knocked down every barrier, hurdled every hurdle. It's because of all that, that you were then in a position to say, now, Lord, now. Yeah. I don't think you, you know what I'm saying? I don't think you get that from just being hatched, you know, and just saying, okay, I'm ready. You know, (laughs) I I don't, I I personally don't think that might not be true for you, but I personally don't think I would be in the position that I'm in and in my place. And I thank you for using that phraseology, which I received today, not only for you, but for me in my place or in place to do what I do. The power comes every Saturday when I'm here, not because I'm so great, but because I'm in my place (laughs) and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So I received that, brother. That's a powerful word. Uh, Powerful uh, word. Yeah, I say. I love it. Now, we're we're out of time, but we're going to go a little over because uh, the I do want to say this to you because back to your liberation and civil rights history, because Mm -hmm. I noticed Mm -hmm. that when you were here with us before, that's not really a part of my personality and a part of my soul work that I was emphasizing at that time. And in my evolution since Mm -hmm. then, I have begun to, it was always there, but I have begun to put it more on front street. And I noticed the response that I get, that I get from you. (laughs) You even said to me one time, Uh I had no idea this was in you and I'm just sitting back and loving this. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, you know what? We are multidimensional beings and nobody Indeed. knows everything that we're capable of. As much as you're showing in your life right now, that's just the tip of your iceberg, brother. The longer you're here, the yeah. more you're going to blossom and grow and bloom. And your story will never be completely written and neither will mine. It's a revolution that we all have, you know, in terms of we're trying to get to point C with skipping point B. You may get to point C, but you got to go through point B first. So those yeah. those aspirations on you trying to get to this particular spot, you may need what you're going through now so you can stand in that place. Because otherwise, if you were in that place, like Robert said before time, you wouldn't have been ever been successful or you might have been a failure, you know, concerning that. And it takes a maturity to understand that. Because 
Yeah. Just like we, we're talking about those kids, you know, we want that quick money, fast money. It's the same thing with us as far as we want to get to that quick destination of everything along those lines without having to go through the specific process because we are impatient. And we feel like sometimes I deserve this, I work hard for this, so this is what I want. And that's not always the case. And it takes a humbling experience sometimes for us to realize that, hey, you know, well, you, you need to back up and walk the walk. Before you get to that mm. Yeah, Brother mm. Quasi, I don't think that you'll ever tap the depth of all that is in you and neither will I. So my bringing more forward, my sort of liberationist ideas and freedom ideas and that part of me, that's always yeah. been there. There are parts of you that have always been there. It's just that you didn't necessarily yeah. see that in me. And maybe I didn't necessarily see certain things in you because we had never gotten there yet. But people, if they think they know yeah. you, when you're serving God, if people think they know you, they're mistaken. They don't really know you. Yes. They don't know all of yes. you. They know bits and pieces. But God is just that vast and wide. And we are reflections of that. So you're never going to know all of me. That well is too deep. But I endeavor yeah. to give what I can give in the moment to the best of my ability as directed by the it. divine. That's my endeavor. I love it. I love that. Again, I, I just I just want to share that for even the listeners, if you go back and really start identifying things that have reoccurred over your life, from yes. childhood up, yes. you'll find out, you'll start identifying where your calling is. You will. Mm -hmm. You will. I, I did it. Yeah, because yeah. three years ago, important. this might have even been four years ago, we did, uh, we were doing a series called Spiritual Contracts. And at the end of that, I asked the question. Remember. remember that? I asked the question, what do I know for sure about who I am? And each one of us went around the room and the word, do you remember what, the word that you chose? No. <laughs> okay. What did I say? That's, I see you searching for it. it, it I'm going to give it to you. The question was, what do I know for sure about who I am? And you said that I am. What a, did I say? You said, I am a believer. That's what you said. I am a That's believer. Good. Dante said he knew he was an encourager. And you said, and I said, I know I'm a wise communicator. And you said, I am a believer. So two things. One, then we're going to end with, end with some poetry from you. Because Brother Poissy is a poet. What is it that you know for sure about who you are right now? Okay. What do I know for sure about who I am right now? What I know for sure is this. I'm a lot stronger than I give myself credit for. And I believe that comes from my belief system. But I can go through anything. You hear me? Mm -hmm. I've been through hell in my life, but I am now on that side where, you know what? Trouble don't last always. It won't always be like this. Things are definitely going to turn around. Therefore, you go through. You endure hard times, but there's a lesson in that test. I can endure anything, but I have to keep going forward. I can't turn around. I can't give up at this moment. I have to push forward to the end of the race. That reminds me of that Kurt Franklin song, The Storm. You ever heard that? There's a blessing in the storm. Oh. Yeah. Well, it is. There's a there blessing is. in the storm. Yes, and there certainly, certainly is. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that about you, Brother Quasi. And so we're going to let you, we're going to let you, we're going to step back to the back of the classroom and let you uh, have the mic and uh, put some poetry uh -oh. on Front Street for us here and let yeah. us reveal yeah. to yeah. us the heart of your artistry in this moment. So over to you for that. <laughs> <laughs> What you're going to hear from me in this season, it's, it's going to sound a little different from some of the poetry that I wrote before. I'm just developing a series, and I don't know if it's going to be a book or if I'm going to write it for a journal or what. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of just emptying out my soul at this time. And it started a few years ago when Trayvon Martin was killed, mm -hmm. and I wrote something. I think I read it on the show before. Since we're a few weeks past his birthday, I promise between February and, of course, April that I would always read my dedication to him and never forget him and speak his name. Mm -hmm. And then I got another poem for you, which is really going to tell you where I am right now. All right, let's hear it. And sure. it's called, They Don't Give a Good Goddamn. Sounds a little more hostile. Brother, listen, writing, brother. But you don't have to disclaim anything on this program. You <laughs> hear me? No disclaimers. No disclaimers right. here. You just give us what you got. Yeah. Just get ready. The first one to Trayvon Martin and to his family, Peace for Our Son. This, which I have needed from some time has come. It has decided to stay. I am grateful for its presence, peace, each and every day. And though the streets are stained with violent blood, and though they try to justify a murderer's lie, and though our children's names are being ran through the mud, the spirit of truth and righteousness will never die. And here we stand with heads held high, covered with hoods, yet underneath we have cleared minds. 
Let it be understood. We are not suspicious because of what we wear. We are more than material that adorns our heads. We are stronger because of this, and God will get the glory for this. And we are not going to go back. We are on track because this is a civil rights issue. This is our cause, and we will not stand down. And while my DNA does not match that of the beloved Trayvon, he is my son, and it is personal. And I am angry. We all should be, color not included. Mm -hmm. They don't give a good goddamn. My children's behavior is angry and hostile. They hit first and then speak. They are sick of protesting and sit in. They want change. They want justice, and they want it now. My children's language isn't polite and sweet. It's rough with growls and lip smacks. They ain't buying this come-to-the-table-ish. They ain't going for the carrot you've been dangling in front of our ancestors' faces. My children's methods are not proven. They are not supported. They are reactive. You give it, you get it. Many may say this is not the way. This is not how we as a people advance. And to you and your ideals on how our people will progress, I say, my children don't give a good goddamn, and I don't either. Mm. All right. Huh? Yeah, I, I feel you, I brother. <laughs> I feel that. Well, I feel I that. Am. And tell me where you were yeah. when you began to write those words. I think I'm at the place, Robert, mm -hmm. of being liberated. Right. So what we try to do it so correct, and we're so nice, mm -hmm. and we're so sweet. This is violent out here. Exactly. This is we have to have the force behind it. So no longer... Are you going to treat me like I'm inferior mm -hmm. and I'm second class, mm -hmm. or I'm not human, or whatever else that you have created, this system that you have created called racism? Mm -hmm. I'm not bowing to it mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. And guess what? I don't necessarily, I am a follower of King, so I try, I do try to be nonviolent. Mm -hmm. However, America, don't allow what you're doing to cause us pretty much to react what's happening and i don't know what's going to come of this i don't know if a race war is coming i don't know but i do know this younger generation they're no punk mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. they're not coming to the table i don't want to talk to you anymore either you treat me right or i'm going to take the matters into my own hands mm -hmm. and i just want to give them a little wisdom on how to do it and strategize mm -hmm. but at this point i get it i get it mm -hmm. they're angry go for it go mm -hmm. for it get yours mm -hmm. get, get your people freedom yeah i hear the power yeah. i hear the liberation i hear the purpose i hear you being in place i love it and i celebrate you i'm glad that that moment has arrived in your life and here's the real revelation brother now is just the beginning now that you're in place all of that was yeah. just rehearsal everything that happened before was just right. dress oh, rehearsal yeah. now it's really starting oh, yeah. it's on now yeah i got my boxing gloves on man yeah. I've, been, I've been in training for a mighty mighty long time so i'm ready i'm ready let's go well, I appreciate you, Brother Quasi. It's so good to reconnect with Thank you. you. Thank you so much, brother. Indeed. And I will speak to you soon. Peace and blessings to everyone. Peace and blessings to uh, you indeed. as well. Y'all take care. Find yourself to love.